how much, Joe, have you looked at, um, you know, Larry Fink, Soro, State Street, you know, uh, Vanguard, BlackRock? How much have you looked at what they're doing and how, what their ties are? I've looked at it. Yeah? Yeah. They're pretty much running everything. Yeah. <laughs> S&P 500, you know, the number that uh, 88% of the companies on S&P 500, 88% of them, the largest shareholder of those companies is either State Street, BlackRock, or Vanguard. 88% of them, okay? And then you see their influence in defense contracts, okay? So we went through a deal. I'm like, let me see if this, these guys, this ESG, Larry Fink, Vanguard, State Street, if they have any influence on military contract, defense contracts. If you Google the largest shareholder for Raytheon, three out of the four, Top shareholders of Raytheon, BlackRock, State Street, and uh, Vanguard. It could be top three with Raytheon, but I think it's three out of four. If you go look up General Dynamics, if you go look up Boeing, if you go look up, you know, Northrop Grumman, okay? And then you work backwards and you say, okay, how much money is that in, the, uh, in, in what these guys are doing? You'll find uh, uh, our you know, the amount of money we spent in our military, $744 billion on how much we're making from de defense, but you'll see some numbers saying last year is 13% of our GDP, which is around $850 billion. That's more than the next 10 combined. We gave more money to Ukraine than Russia spent on their military last year. And when you look at these contracts, then you're like, okay, Fink is there. These guys are there. Like, okay, let's go look at Hollywood. Same thing you see there. Let's go look at pharmaceutical. Let's go look at this. And you're like, wait a minute. These guys essentially have a monopoly. Well, how big is BlackRock? $10 trillion. How big is $10 trillion? Only two countries have a bigger GDP than what BlackRock has, assets under management, U.S. and China. That's how big BlackRock is. So then they went and they started getting all these other guys to sign on and say, hey, we want you to participate with the same thing as what well with ESG. And they ended up having, I think they had 31 signers, I think end of 2022, they got 60 uh, something signers for a total of $70 trillion of assets under management that they're controlling. So now they're controlling other places. And just recently, if you saw the rebuilding of Ukraine, did you see this contract? Rebuilding of Ukraine, $400 billion contract. BlackRock and Chase is helping rebuild Ukraine. And then, you know, okay, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but what the hell is going on here? They have that much control to get everybody to do what they want them to do? Yes. So Dylan Mulvaney, who cares? Why? Bud Light. How does that tie up? You got the DEI, the HRC, the human rights, and all this stuff. And then you go even deeper, which is even the crazier part, with... You know, the, the education, schools, like, you know, the biggest uh, union we have in America, I think it's national education something. NEA is the largest uh, union. We have three million teachers are part of that union. And, and you look at that and you go deeper in that with open society and who's funding it, who's the money behind these organizations, comes back, Soros, Soros, Soros. How do you feel about the kind of power they have right now to fight against them? Because this isn't like a billionaire can come out and say, I'm going to go up, up against these guys. They don't have a little bit of money. A billionaire to these guys is nothing. They got the kind of control that can make companies fire boards. They can replace CEOs. They can replace leaders if they don't like. They have their hands so much into it where uh, many times when people say they, the people of power, the people of power, I'm kind of like, who are the people of power? Are you convinced these guys are really running the world, or what do you think about what some of these bigger companies are doing, like State Street, Vanguard, and BlackRock? Well, they certainly have massive amounts of influence. What do you think they're doing? Uh, it's, it's, the question is, how do you fight it? Like, for example, the way we fight mainstream is by what? The show that we do. And we have to be patient. It's going to take two, three, four, five, ten, twenty 10, 20 years. Now you have some influence, right? Okay, we can fight. There is an actual strategy on how to fight that no problem you got a kid in school who's a bully he's bigger than you he keeps bullying you you have a strategy on how to beat the guy you take a year jujitsu two years this this that boom 
One fight, he knows, I'm never going to touch Joe again. Screw this thing. I'm not doing this no more, right? There is a play to it. When you have this much, Joe, 88% of S&P 500 companies, that is a form of a monopoly. If I'm a president, whether it's a Trump or whoever else goes out there and does it, our monopoly law in America is 50%. They say 50%. Like if you tie and say, at what point is a 50%? I've done calls with the FTC. Like we had one of our guys' technology we were using. The FTC called and said, hey, we want to have a call with you because they're thinking about buying this other technology company and we're worried it's going to be a monopoly. So we had the call, okay? At the end of the call with us, with a bunch of different people, we said, we love their product, we love their product. That deal didn't end up happening, okay? The monopoly law. Some of these guys are influencing it. But they say 50% is a monopoly law. Do you know how many people in America have an iPhone versus Droid? you know what the number is, market shares in America with iPhones? I think it's like 60. 58%, 60%. That is already a monopoly. But who's knocking on the door of Apple? Tim Cook saying, hey, Tim, you got 58%. That's breaking a monopoly law. Nobody is. I think someone's got to break apart. You know, in 1993, I don't know which senator it was, they, th- these guys that were trying to get the defense contractors to be better at the pricing, what they were charging, because they were overcharging DOD and DOD. People don't know what the hell is going on. They're like, yeah, okay. How much? $68 million do it. $1.2 billion do it. I'm not going to over-negotiate the money. They took 51 defense companies, and they brought it down to only five. It's only five companies right now when you want to buy anything. Th- think about that. So defense contractors is five. We know how these guys make money. Earlier, you know, I was asking you a question, why do you think vaccine? And you're like, Pat, that's how they make their money, right? I mean, if, a, if you and I run a hotel, rooms are empty, we're not making money. We need people to stay in the rooms. If you and I are running a hospital, we need people on the beds to make money. Yeah. If there's no people on the beds, we ain't making money. If these five contractors are fighting for $744 billion, what do they want more of? Wars. They want more people dying. You know the Papa John saying... Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys is more wars, more people dying, more profits, defense contractors, right? That's a valid concern that I have because yeah. behind closed doors, this whole military industrial complex, when you look at the numbers, whoever becomes the president, unfortunately, this guy's an anti establishment president, good. Unfortunately, if you're an anti establishment president, Everyone's going to come after you, especially these military defense contractors. So if a president got up and said, if I'm going to be the president, here's what we're going to be doing. We have to look at all the contracts. You can't overcharge us. We have to open it up. You have to sell some of your companies. You have to let them be independent again. You have to do this. You have to let them go public, separate, whatever way you got to break them apart to have competition again, because we don't have that today. You know, So that is a major concern where... We say we have a commander-in-chief, but really the commander-in-chief is Larry Fink today. The guy running BlackRock is really the president of the United States, if we look at the kind of influence he's got in every industry, Joe. And he's like, well, you know, I kind of feel bad. I'm ashamed that all the weaponization, the word, you know, ESG is being used and all this other stuff. And Elon tweeted about the ESG. I don't know if you remember when Elon tweeted about ESG saying the S in ESG is satanic. Okay, so this is a part where even a Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's partner, says, look, I love Larry Fink, but I'm not interested in having an emperor. Some words like that he said about Larry Fink. So this motive, and by the way, Larry Fink is an interesting guy because he majored in college political science. His aspirations was politics. He accidentally got into money. And he learned to trade, and then he lost $100 million at, at 36 years old, I think. And then he teams up with Schwartzman, and they start this company. And after a couple of years, they got $5 billion under management, $8 billion, and $32 billion. And then they have a difference because, you know, he wants to give equity, and Jamie's, you know, Schwartzman's like, no, and then they separate. But influence of politics, you get into business, you're a billionaire. It's you, Soros. So I'm, I'm extremely concerned about what these guys are up to. And we think our president is the most powerful person. That prince is not. Because behind closers are going to be like, look, guys, let's relax. That guy's only going to be there for four to eight years. We're going to be all right. He'll be out. We're running the world. We're okay. We were running America, but now we're running the world. We control all the ETFs in America. We're controlling all this stuff. 
everyone has to come through us and we can tell everybody what to do because everybody fears not getting money from us, from being downgraded. A Tesla on ESG score is nothing, but a Philip Morris gets an A rating. How the hell the company that's Philip Morris has a better environmental social governance score, DEI, you know, not DEI, but the CEI the, uh, score they give it over Tesla. So th- they can bully some of these guys. Now, Elon is vocal. Elon can stand up. Elon's not the guy that can be bullied. But some of these other guys that don't have 150 million followers and they don't own a company called Twitter, they may be billionaires. They may be $50 million guys, CEOs. But they got to sit there and say, babe, if you say something, you're going to lose your $26 million a year salary. Just do what Larry tells you to do. Imagine if you had control of 88% of CEOs of S&P 500 companies. What kind of influence do you have? So, so to me, as a person, when I asked you earlier, what are your top five things you would want somebody to run on? I think somebody's got to figure out a way to break those companies apart. Do you think that's possible? Do you think they would ever allow that to happen? I, I do think it's possible, but... I also think it's possible that that person who does it is risking a lot of things. There's a lot of risk, you know. For example, again, going back to Jenk, I love hearing these types of arguments. It's like, oh, you know, I said, did you watch Oppenheimer? I did. I think you watch Oppenheimer. No, I haven't seen it yet. Oh, you haven't seen it? Okay. No. So, anyways, when you watch Oppenheimer, uh, it's a three hour movie. They could have done it in two hours, but if you're somebody that's interested in that stuff, you got to watch it. So I had to go watch it. Okay. I said, what do you think about the ending? What he says to Einstein? I won't say what he said, but they had a, they had a Einstein and him have a meeting at the end at this place and how, look what we invented, right? He says, Oh, there is no way I want the button to be controlled by Trump. No way. It would be a world war three. I said, okay, fine. Jenk friendly conversation. We have four years of track record of what happened under Trump. No wars, peace. No one talked about ISIS. People forgot about ISIS. All we feared was ISIS. All of a sudden, we're not talking about ISIS. And the place was fine. He wanted people to stop dying, right? There's nothing going on on all these other places. Yeah, but look what he did with Edel, you know, El, you know, Sheldon Adelson or you know, the whole thing with the $100 million. I say, but he didn't take money from the establishment. He wasn't controlled by those guys. So it, when you think about what is really going on and what could happen with it, I think it's going to be a lot of work, but I think it's a big risk on the person that decides to go after these guys. There's certain people you go after, you better be ready for it. I think going after BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard is going to be formidable. Opponent. Has anybody openly stated they want to do that? I think Vivek is a person who is making a lot of noise with that. He wrote a book specifically on ESG, Vivek did. Um, And by the way, Vivek is a very interesting guy. Very interesting. 37, 38 years old, working his ass off, family guy, billionaire, self-made, born here, smart guy, intelligent guy, well-spoken, respectful with the opponent when he's giving his presentation. Don Lemon is pushing him on. He says, look, Don, respectfully, I just disagree. Here's where we are. Um, and he went from last place to getting past Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, Mike Pence. He's passing all these guys up. There's only one person now he's got to pass up. He's about to pass. In Ohio, he's ahead of DeSantis, by the way. Mm-hmm. And very soon he's going to pass up DeSantis. So it's going to be him and Trump. So if Trump's not going to be doing the debate and they, those guys go and debate. Now imagine if Trump runs and Vivek is a VP. Trump may go Tim Scott. Trump may go, uh, you know, many different angles. You may go. Trump and Vivek would be very interesting. Oh, my God. It would be very interesting. Very hard to be. Yeah. So to answer your question, Vivek's gone after the ESG folks. Mm. He knows the game. So meaning. What, now let me ask you this. What do you think the goal of ESG is? What, why do you think they're establishing these sort of parameters? Like why, why is ESG a thing and what's the benefit of it for them? <sighs> So Schultz said something very interesting. Schultz says, look, these guys are driven by money. They're not going to do anything to destroy an economy to lose their own money because right. they want that. I said, okay, so very good. Andrew Schultz, I said, that's right. a very good point uh, uh, you know, on, on what you're saying. Fine. So you know, y- y- you know how sometimes Michael Jackson, you see the interview with him with kids. Oh, they're just sleeping in the bed. That's all it is. And we're just having a great time and we're storytelling. And like, 
yeah, bro, I get it. You know, it's a little weird. You got a seven, eight year old, 10 year old kid sleeping in your bed and you know, all this stuff. And I'm just, it's a little bit fishy what you're talking about here. It's not normal. Well, if you're in Hollywood and you've slept with as many people as these people sleep and then eventually you have to have other options because what else do you do? You have to try new things. How many threesomes have you had? How many this? How many that? So you start trying all these other things and sometimes these guys go to such and such place. doesn't matter. It's kind of weird and fishy, right, on what you want to do. Great. Okay. So why are these guys doing what they're doing? You have all the money in the world. You live in a $100 million house, not you. Larry Fink and some of these guys. You, mm-hmm. not, I'm not, I don't know if he lives in a $100 million house, right, but you got the saying. money to live yeah. in a $100 million house. What else do you need? Right. You got nice cars. Jamie Dimon's got a $900 million art collection, according to an article. It's a nice art collection, right? You go to all the nice restaurants. You meet prime ministers. You meet presidents. And then maybe there comes a time when you're looking at a couple of these guys, they're presidents and prime ministers, and you tell yourself, I'd be a better president than you, bro. How the hell am I not reading the country? Or they tell themselves, you think you're a president? You're not a president. You work for me. What else is the motive? But ESG, how does that factor into But that the point is control is what I'm saying. So the motive okay. becomes control more than money. After you have all the money in the world, what's next? It's got to be control or a true vision. So a Soros, when you're talking ESG, that story is a completely different story. You ever heard Soros' interview with 60 Minutes where he says, I see myself as a god? Have you ever seen this uh, interview or, or what he says? No. Really? He said oh. he sees himself as a god. Oh, my God. Uh, 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 Jamie, do you mind pulling up the quote? I think it's if you type in LA Times Soros God. If you type in LA Times Soros, Soros, God, when you hear what he says, it's like the second to the last paragraph all the way to the bottom. The guy asks a question, you know, about who he views himself as. I want to, I want to quote it properly exactly what he says. In this Is there interview. a video of him saying Yeah, a 60 minutes. There's a video as well. So if you go all the way to the bottom, go a little bit higher, go a little bit higher in the quote. About means the next of my friends, my friends, my friends, my friends, my friends, no, go a little higher. I think it's a little higher. Blah, 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 blah. I'm kind of so. For example, self center, 27. So I keep going higher. I sort of with them. So I keep going higher, keep going higher, keep going higher. Prevail values. A little higher, a little higher. There's a part where he says, uh, keep going. What year is this article, by the way? Is this an, it's, a, it's an all, old article. It's supposed October to be. 2004. That's the one. This is the one. Uh, I've, okay, right there. It seems that Soros believes he was anointed, anointed by God. I fancied myself as some kind of a God. If truth be known, I carried some rather potent messianic fantasies with me from childhood, which I felt I had to control. Otherwise, they might get me in trouble. And then on the next line, when asked by Britain's independent newspaper to elaborate on the passage, Soros says, it is sort of a disease when you consider yourself some kind of a God, the creator of everything, but I feel comfortable about it now since I began to live it out. Whoa. (laughs) Since I began to live it out, those unfamiliar with Soros would probably dismiss this statement out of hand, but for those who have followed his career and socio-political endeavors, it cannot be taken quite so lightly. Soros has proved that with the vast resources of money at his command, he has the ability to make the once unthinkable acceptable. His work as a self-professed amoral financial speculator has left millions in poverty when their national currencies were devalued, and he pumped so much cash into shaping the former Soviet republics to his liking that he has bragged that the former Soviet empire is now the Soros empire. That's right. Ask anybody who's from Hungary, bring up the name Soros, see what they say about him. This guy's manipulated the uh, market currencies. Yeah, he's like a bad guy in a movie. So he's like a bad guy in a movie. Like but a here's, Batman movie. He's being interviewed on 60 Minutes. Okay. See if you can find that video. If you can find the interview, uh, he's being interviewed on 60 Minutes. And he says, so you're 14 years old. You're being used by Nazis to go find Jews. Okay. And that must have had a big impact in your life because you're essentially helping people be found that they're going to kill you know this did that impact you at all his answer no not really and he's got a smile on his face and the guy comes back this is a famous interviewer from 60 minutes you you'll recognize the face on who it is and he says no not really he says at that time you know 
uh, when you're thinking about life, you're not thinking about things like this, et cetera, et cetera. When okay. he's 14. When he's 14 years yeah. old. I think at 14, you are thinking, like I'm having real conversations with my nine-year-old son. I was at a refugee camp at 10 to 12, Joe, in Germany with Czechs, Yugoslavians, Pakistanis, Afghanistan people. And I remember the conversations. I remember why they left. This is the one. Let me see. Da, 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 da. It's 20 minutes long, so I'm going to No, if part. you can find, if you go on Twitter, best way to do it, Jim. I found it on Twitter, and it was taken down for copyright grounds. So I, have uh, to I mean, that to totally makes it. sense. Yeah, that totally so makes Charlie sense. Charlie Rose's interview. Right? No, this is not the one. It's not Charlie Rose. It's another person, Jamie. I'll, I'll, I'll find it here right now. It looks like the same video. Uh, Soros um, asked uh, Nazi. Here, let me see if I can find this. Um, interview. It says it's talking about him, but th this is the link I clicked, and it was different. Experience. Anyways, there is a clip. You, if you keep looking for it, there is a shorter version of it where he's being asked. So he's just kind of like downplaying it. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, just kind of downplaying it. And I'm like, I want to really know this guy's story. So I watch his documentary. And the documentary they made about him is a pro Soros documentary. Here we go. Like, Okay, that's the it's one. It's on the Internet Archive. That Apparently, is the one. So, this link said it was scrubbed from the Internet, but I don't know. So if true. you can find it, I don't know if you can listen to it on the mic while we're doing a podcast to find it. It's You can't do that. Okay. So it, it's going to be... It's also not going to load up very well either. Yeah, so dude. If, you, I mean, if you've seen it, you've seen it. He's being asked, and he just kind of has a smile on his face. Now, here's a guy that at 14 years old, um, Russian soldiers raped his mom twice. So he's gone through some traumatic experiences, you know, and yeah, I mean, dude, the clip is insane. If you can find the clip, there's there's a thirty second clip on Twitter that that's out there. So this guy starts Open Society Foundation. Do you know how much money he's given to Open Society Foundation in the last thirty years? How much? Thirty two billion dollars, bro. Thirty two billion dollars is given to Open Society Foundation. That's not a small money. He's worth seven billion right now, which is passing on to his son Alex, I believe. That's his name, thirty-eight year old guy, which is just like his father. Okay, so what is the problem with a Soros versus a Fink? They're both true believers. Like Soros is not doing this because he wants to be, you know, he already fancies himself as a god. Th this godlike tendency, when it happens to some people, where your entire life you're know, winning, I'm this, I'm that, and you know. You know how you sometimes talk to some people and you're like, dude, you really believe you're the shit. You're not. You really believe you're better than everybody else. Like there are certain people that actually really believe that. You know how there's an insecurity of a typical good fighter or good athlete where, you know, is that it? I think I, this, this is, is it. You got it. Now. That's the one. All right, well, one second. That's the one. You're in a human. There you go. You're because, perfect. Uh, this is it. Societies have deficiencies as well. Oh, and a right. Jew who escaped the Holocaust mm -hmm. by posing as a, a Christian. Right. And you watched lots of people get shipped off to the death camps. Right. I was 14 years old. And I would say that that's when my character was made. In what way? That one should think ahead, one should understand and, and anticipate events, uh, and uh, one, one is threatened. It was a tremendous threat of evil. I mean, it was a, a very personal experience of evil. My understanding is, is that you went out with this protector of yours. This is it. swore that you were uh, his adopted godson. Yes, yes, yes. Went out, in fact, and helped in the confiscation of property from the Jews. That's right. I mean, that's, that sounds uh, like an experience that would send lots of people to the psychiatric couch for many, many years. Was it difficult? Uh, uh, not, not, not at all. Not at all. Look at that. Uh, maybe as a child you don't, you don't see the connection, uh, uh, but it, was, it created no, no problem at all. No feeling of guilt? No. For example, that uh, I'm Jewish... Uh, and here I am watching these people go, I could just as easily be there, I should be there, none of that. Well, uh, uh, of course, I, uh, I could be on the other side, or I could be the one from whom it, the thing is being taken away. 
but there was no sense that I shouldn't be there because uh, that was uh, uh, well actually in a funny way it's just like in markets that if I weren't there of course I wasn't doing it but somebody else would, 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 would be taking it away anyhow in other words the, whether I was there or not I was only a spectator the property was being taken away so the, I had no role in taking away that property. So I had no sense of guilt. That makes sense, though. If you were 14 and this thing was happening and you were just uh, a 14-year-old boy who was just going along with people that were doing this, I would, it would make sense that you wouldn't have a feeling of, of guilt, that you weren't responsible for that. Everybody's going to respond to a life-changing event like that in a different way. Yeah. Okay. Um, to be desensitized the way you have from a situation like that. The way he describes it. Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, you're, it's, a you're, it's a little spooky to answer yeah. the way you do. People yeah. die like, oh, you know, it's funny. It's kind of like the market. No, no. People died right. is, is what they went through. So yeah, His thought is it's going to happen either way, whether I'm involved or Exactly. Not. Which, yeah. by the way, that, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's true or it's not. But th this, this becomes the problem. This becomes a problem. So... People ask the question, so what do you think is wrong with America? What do you think is wrong with the world? What do you think is wrong? Da, 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 da. All these conversations you have, and it's like you're at the cigar lounge, you have the combo. Okay. I think we have a hero making machine problem. I think we have a very big hero making machine problem. And what I mean by hero making machine problem is this kids are confused who's a hero today. When you and I were 14 years old, who was a hero, Joe? Think about it. When you were 14, when you were 18, when you were 25, who was a hero? If we go back, like when I was 14, oh man, I was, what year is it, 30 years ago, 1992, 1993, who was a hero? Michael, you know, Jordan, sports, billionaires, life of the rich and famous, mm -hmm. you know, guys like that. Just a very innocent, that's a hero. You know, like one day when I grow up, I want to be ba 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 right? Today, the hero is the victim. Today is the hero, the person that's going through a mutilation and the parents support their seven-year-old going through it. What a hero Dwayne Wade is. You know, what a hero, you know? And the mother of the child is saying, why don't you just wait till this kid is 18 years old to do it? No, we're leaving the state of Florida because Florida is not allowing us to do what our kid wants to do. That's a hero today, Joe. A hero today is the person that dresses up as a syringe, goes as a show, late night show, and is getting people to take the vaccine. That's a hero today. That's, that's what they've painted as a hero today. And the longer these guys control who the hero is, kids are going to be confused. We're not recognizing the parent that is doing what he's doing with his kids and doing a hard job of raising his kids. It's not easy being married. Marriage is very hard. You and I are both married. It's not easy being married. It's a very hard job to be married. And you have kids, and you have self-interest, and you have your own selfish desires, and you want to be a good dad, and you want to be a good husband, and you want to do any. That's not easy stuff to do. But guess what? Who are we turning into a hero? Not, not the father that's taking his responsibilities and doing his part. That's a boring story. Let's not turn that person into a hero. Let's not turn a person into a hero that's fighting the establishment. That's not the hero. That's the villain. That's the villain. Joe's the villain. You're not a villain. You're a hero. So unless if we get back to selling the dream, like when I watch Ron DeSantis, I ask myself, sell the dream. Sell me America. Sell me why this is the greatest country in the world. We're no longer selling the dream. We're not selling the bigness. It's nightmare. It's confusion. It's gaslighting. It's dividing and selling people into heroes that are not necessarily heroes. George Soros, uh, to, to see what he's done with his life and what he's doing with his money right now, where he's investing it, this guy wants to change the way a lot of things are being done. He wants to go from America, you know, as long as I have my money and I got influence around the world versus seeing what America is doing, that's not a good thing for me. You know, if, if you study Hitler, and I don't know if you've read Mein Kampf or not, or if you've gone through it or not, the translation in you know, English. You see how this guy used to go to local debates just to watch. 
You go to local stuff that was going on, small little things local that they're voting for. You know, Scott was like a big architecture guy. He liked buildings. He liked stuff like that. <laughs> and and you kind of like, okay, so what was this guy's motive? What was he doing? You know, what was he getting rid of? He realized later on, you know, people can't believe in God. That's a big enemy, Joe. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not debating Christianity or religion, specifically like a God. We can't recognize people that believe in God. That's risky. You know, we can't. We can't really be doing that because if people believe in God, they believe future is bright. You know, people who have faith are typically like, I have faith. What is a main basis of faith? I think everything's going to work out. No, I don't want you to think that. I want you to think it's the end of the world. Climate change is coming. I don't want you to think everything's going to work out. I want you to think the future is scary and you need us and we're here to save you. That's kind of how they're pitching their savior mindset. God-like fancied myself as a sort of a God and now that it's become reality and I'm experiencing it. So these are not people that are sitting there saying, well, that guy keeps talking about God a little bit too much, man. That's not good. We don't need people to believe in God. We need people to believe in government. That's a scary thought. So for me, I think... You know, when, when we have the debate with religion, uh, it's, a, it's a great debate to have, you know, with, with Muslims or, you know, Seven Day or Scientology. There was a year, 2003, I was an atheist for 24, 25 years of my life, and I'm going out there trying to find out what's really going on. I'd go read Dianetics. I'd go read all this stuff on, you know, LDS and, you know, Gordon B. Hinckley or Cleon, you know, all these guys you're reading on. Like, oh, okay, okay, I see this here. I see this here. There's a place for religion debate. Let's do that. No problem. But for me, I want as many people around me to try to exercise whatever faith they're going, whether you're a Christian, Catholic, you know, you're LDS, you're this, you're that. I'm a non-denominational Christian today, right? We need more people to have faith, to see that future looks bright. Doesn't mean we don't need to be skeptical. Doesn't mean we don't need to be, you know, only the paranoid survive. That's a quality in business you need. But I think there's a bit of a confusion right now with who we're turning into heroes. And the more we do that, we don't know who we want to be when we grow up. Who do you want to be when you grow up? Shit, I don't know. People who bitch a lot, whine a lot, cry a lot, do these TikTok videos of eating, doing all this stuff. I, they're, getting all, they're getting famous. That's what I'm going to be. Those are clowns. That's not a hero. But that's who we're turning into heroes. So how do you think ESG factors into that? ESG factors in it that they get to dictate. You have to, you know, do the LGBTQ Explain stuff. Explain ESG to people. Okay. So, for, for example, Hollywood. What's Hollywood going through right now? Oscars came out. I don't know if you saw the structure on Oscars. Have you seen what it is to be nominated for an Oscar today? Yeah. That you have to have a portion of your actors be either disabled, black, part of the LGBTQ, the workers behind closed doors, da 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 all this stuff that they have to be part of the, the, the sect to get funding or to be nominated and all that stuff. Who gives a shit that I have to do that? But people do it to get a high score. If you get a high score, you get more money, you get rated better. You're, How you, do they get more money? Okay, so if, if I'm a, um, if I'm a uh, uh, State Street or Vanguard or XYZ company, okay, the, the more you're growing, you're gonna need to raise capital. You're going to need people to invest into your company, whether you're going public or it's pi private or you're raising debt. There's only a few companies that are behemoths to go and get money from those guys. If you want money from those guys, you have to follow their guidelines. If you don't have a high ESG score, DEI score, they're simply not interested in your company. Why do you think they're implementing this? Why do I think they're implementing this? Uh, uh, in regards to uh, in regards to what? Why do you think they're doing? You know the uh, indoctrination, the grooming. So the way the, they're just laying it out with ESG scores. Why do you think they're doing control? That? I control what you want to do. I can try dictate the terms. You know, I I dictate the terms on what you need to do. Like even when they talk about environmental, most of these companies are not doing anything to improve the environment. They use it as a we're doing this because climate change is a real crisis. And we're being noble because we're worried about the future, but then behind closed doors, that's not what's showing up. You know, we're just fighting after a score. When, when we were selling our insurance company, I'll never forget this, we're meeting with a bunch of buyers. Now, my, the company we built, insurance, the average agent was a 56-year-old uh, white male. That was the life insurance industry. Like, think about a life insurance agent. 
what does that person look like? They don't look like this, right? Okay, so in America, it was 56-year-old white male. Well, I said, I'm going to go a complete different angle. When we sold the insurance company, our average agent was a 34-year-old Hispanic female. So I'm going and talking to buyers. One of the buyers we talked to, they're like, hey, we're having a hard time recruiting African-Americans and Hispanics to want to come work for companies like ours. We need it because we need to increase our DEI score. What's your DEI score? And we show our DEI score. These are your numbers, yeah. You see them talking to each other when we step out. Well, you know, I think our board would like to learn a little bit more because this would be a great partnership for us because this can help us with our DEI score. You shouldn't buy us because we're diverse. You should buy right. us because we're a good investment. So, so the decision-making process is being diluted simply based on pleasing the people at the top that are giving these guys a score. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So versus go produce a better product, be more competitive, let the guys compete in the free marketplace, and let's see who wins. And how long ago did this get implemented? This is not, a, uh, this is not something that's been around for a long time. Yes, she's a recent thing uh, that they started. They originally started with something called a PRI, which I want to say, if you can type in ESG PRI, I think it's 2006, I want to say, when they started off with this. And then gradually... There is the uh, HRC organization that was now given e, you know, uh, uh, CEI scores, and then they started giving DEI scores. But it started off with a 2006 PRI, some of this stuff. And if you go a little bit further back, this started a long time ago by uh, uh, another person who um, wanted to kind of indoctrinate businesses, control businesses. They didn't like businesses that were having as much power as they were having. But it's recently that's turned into what it is today where people are actually concerned about their scores. And so you think this was a strategic decision to try to gain more control over corporations and to do, throw, do so through the guise of social justice and environmental protection? Yes. So think about, um, you know, Equifax, TransUnion, and, you know, What's the last one? I'm forgetting one of them. Equifax, TransUnion. Who's the third one that does your credit score? Equifax, TransUnion. There's one other one that does it, right? When you want to buy a house, if you got a credit score of 600, what are you going to do? You're not going to get that house. You're not going to get the best rate you want, right? So people, I got to increase my FICA score. Why don't you come back a year from now, two years from now, let's get a pre-approval letter, letter based on your credit is improved and all this. Okay, that's, that's okay, because we're getting, we're getting responsible people to buy a house. No problem. I'll make my car payment. I'll do all this other stuff. But imagine if now they, they say, Joe, you don't have enough gay friends. You don't have enough gay employees. You don't have enough black employees. You know, you don't have enough this. You don't have enough that. Then you're sitting there saying, guy, I'm just running a company. I'm hiring whoever's qualified that wants my job. It could be anybody that's qualified. You're no longer making decisions based on what's best for your company. You're making decisions because you want to get that loan. You want to raise that capital. You want to raise that mm -hmm. money. And the amount of control, I can, I can tell you a bunch of different stats on uh, what uh, uh, Finks and Wall St State Street and what Vanguard, what these guys are doing. They have a lot of power in America today. So you think this is a premeditated strategy in order to gain control? 100%. I'm convinced in, in that side, absolutely. And they got a lot. And by the way, it's not one industry. Every industry, like imagine in every industry, there's a power player, right? Media was Rupert Murdoch. If you watch Rupert Murdoch's, what he owns, they own marketwatch.com. Most people don't know that. That's under News Corp. You know, Fox News, Rupert Murdoch owns Wall Street Journal. Most people don't know that. That's owned by News Corp. Same company that owns Fox News. So, okay. Guess what? Rupert is a power player in the media space. Good for you. Ted Turner is a power player in the media space until he sold the CNN, Time Warner, all that stuff. Up until that, Ted Warner was uh, Ted uh, uh, Turner was the guy, right? He ran for president one time. He was the guy, right? So he bought the Hawks. He bought the Falcons. I think he owned the, uh, you know, Hawks at one point. He owned all these things. You know, he bought channels. He bought this. He bought that. He was the guy. Great. No problem. But imagine now there's power players that control 50 industries. That's a real power player. It's not a Musk who owns Tesla is worth $200 billion. 
and you know is doing his businesses and I'm going to make Twitter into the next WeChat and it's going to be worth a trillion dollars. That's great. These guys collectively, they're sitting on $70 trillion of power. That's why Elon tweeted out and said satanic is what the S stands for in ESG. So it's no longer power player by industry. It's power player of all industries. 88% of S&P 500 company, one of those three companies is the largest shareholder. That's pretty fucking crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, so it's it's like a form of monopoly that's not illegal. It's a form of monopoly that's not illegal. Wow. Somebody's got to break that apart. And it's going to be, the person to do that's got to be a right guy to do that. Is that possible? <sighs> I think the more you talk, like what did you do, Joe? The more you talk about a topic, the more everybody says, that can't be true. And then what do we do? Oh, shit. Ivermectin, India, blah, blah, So what? Hydrox, what, what are you talking about? So why is this such a big deal? Wait. And then you go four hours one night till one o'clock in the morning. Kids are asleep, and we've all gone through. During COVID, we all did that. Yeah. What, the, what is going on here, right? Okay. So the more we talk about this, the more people are going to go do this, and they're going to say, oh, shit, this is actually happening. And then the more people talk about it, then we the people have been fooled to not realize we have the power. Guys like you have validated in the last three years that we do have the power. And if we do our research and question things the right way, respectful way, people have to respond. Eventually they're cornered. This is not something a lot of people have talked about. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.